when I, I finally decided after a few months I needed to go and see for myself what was really going on. That was in early 2001, and so began the most unusual trip I've ever undertaken. Many years before, I had been in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan. In that case, I had been taught the language, I was married, I had a very official support system helping me and, and supporting me. In this case, I was going to be traveling alone, and I had no organization guiding or sponsoring me whatsoever. As I landed on February 7, 2001, at 8 p.m., I experienced the pang of the fear of what was it going to be like for me as a single female American to wander alone through a Muslim man that was in the middle of a violent uprising. And that was the epicenter of a region that we're always told is hostile to Americans and to women in general. What was it going to be like for me? What I discovered on that trip and on my trip since is that these were myths that are as untrue as they are believed, widely believed. I was welcomed, I was invited to stay in people's homes, I was treated with respect and I was completely safe, um, except when I came too close to the Israeli military. The invariable response when people learned that I was American was welcome. That's been the response whenever I have gone to West Bank and Gaza, has been welcome. And yet the images we see are always of terrorists. Well, these are po photographs I took without a photographic lens. I'm showing them to you here as a terrorist. Um, these were people that were burning a, a wooden, a cardboard box, basically, in a funeral for a small boy who had been killed the day before. Yes, we should see these, but it seems to me we should see what the people look like that were in the, that funeral. This is what most of the people look like. This is the crowd. This girl said to me, do you think that we're all terrorists? Because they know that's what we are being led to believe about them. Um, I also talked to Christians. I would ask them, how is it for you? You're a tiny minority in, in what's now mostly a Muslim land of the West Bank and Gaza. How is it? And they would say, we are all Palestinians. We're all Palestinians and we're all being pushed out by Israel. Um, this is their son who's had, holding a fragment of the Israeli missile that came through their home. As I went through this area, I found that Palestinians were being kept virtually in little prisons within bigger prisons. This is back 2001. They often couldn't go from one town to the next town over. Like I drove here from Pasadena today. In Palestine, I would have gone through checkpoint after checkpoint to try to go to that distance. Those are Israeli checkpoints. That's a, a foreign entity having military checkpoints on somebody's land. And by checkpoints, by the way, I don't mean toll boots. I mean soldiers in combat gear with machine guns. In Gaza, I grew used to almost arriving at a street corner and seeing young soldiers in a tank with a fixed machine gun aimed straight at you. You hoped they waved you on rather than shooting you, as they did some people. At night, you couldn't really see the soldiers very well, but you could see the flashlight with which they signaled whether or not you were allowed to continue driving to continue living. This was routine in Gaza. But some parts were even less desirable than others. These parts were being shelled nightly before a single rocket had been fired, before any of these rockets had been fired. I went through residential neighborhoods that were bullet riddled, destroyed homes. I don't, people would come to me up, come to me in, in crowds, because there were not other journalists wandering around, I tell you. And they, they would welcome me smile at me and, and want to show me every bullet hole in their homes. And children, when they saw I was curious about the spent bullets, would gather them to me by <laughs> handfuls. As I was going around this area and people were welcoming me and smiling at me and showing me their Swiss cheese homes, there was suddenly more gunfire, very close Israeli gunfire. We all ducked and left that area. As I wrote later in an email, I thought this was a coincidence at first, but when I thought about it more, I thought, wait. As I was going around this area, this is the Khan Yunus area in Gaza, I would occasionally peek over sandbag barricades or out shuttered windows, and I could see Israeli guard towers overlooking us. And I have no doubt that those Israeli soldiers could see that a foreigner was going around. Going around. And I, I suspect they finally decided to send her a message. Don't come here. Don't see what we're doing. Israeli forces have killed and injured many journalists, by the way many, including Americans. We just don't hear about them. I saw agricultural lands, beautiful agricultural lands, that were being destroyed, flattened. 
I saw ancient olive groves, some hundreds of years old, completely destroyed. I saw, this is a, a stand of 100-year-old date palms destroyed by Israeli forces. I talked to farmers who had farmed there forever. Their fathers had farmed there, their grandfathers, their great-grandfathers had farmed this land. They knew every tree. And now their orchards, their trees, their crops, their land was destroyed. I wonder how they would feed their children. What does a farmer do when everything is destroyed? And this is what I was seeing in, in Gaza and the West Bank. It seems to me, and it was along the beautiful blue Mediterranean Sea, I saw a people and a land being destroyed by my tax money. To me, that's newsworthy. And this isn't just normal poverty. This is intentionally created poverty. I talked to women who had had homes who are now living in tin shanties and tents in the dirt. At one point, I, I sat with one woman in her tent in the dirt. The international community gives them tents without floors. And I found that Palestinians are almost invariably gracious, welcoming hosts. She gave me sweet mint tea, and she asked me to tell Americans about them. I told her I would try. And I saw more. I just won't go over it. I don't like seeing suffering. I don't like seeing children in pain. But if I wanted to know what was going on in Palestine, and since thousands of children had been injured through the use of my tax money, it was my job to see them. All I had to do was go to the nearest hospital, and I saw them. I saw children with bullets in their backs and in their stomachs and in their heads. I saw a brain-dead 12-year-old. His crime was throwing stones at invading soldiers. I saw children that will never walk again. They won't frolic. They won't skip. Their childhoods are finished. I saw parents who were happy to see me because they thought that as an American maybe I could help their poor destroyed son. I asked the doctor if there was care that could be provided. He said that he hadn't told the, I bring in a surgeon or fly a surgeon. He told me that he hadn't yet found the right time and the right way to tell the parents, but that their son was totally and eternally paralyzed. And so I knew something they didn't know, and I wished that I didn't. And now you do too. And then I went to Ramallah where I saw a newspaper office with sandbags against bullets. And I, when I first got to the office, they said a nine-year-old boy was shot nearby. Maybe you'd like to go see. And I thought, no, I wouldn't like to go see. But I was a journalist there for all of us, and I did. And I took pictures of his blood. I saw where the little boy had been sitting watching his father paint the wall. I saw the wet paint, the toy trucks, the blood. I saw the wall hanging in the living room that had a bullet hole in it that said, I'm told, thinking of God makes our hearts grow calm. I saw the needle point over the front door that I could read that said, God bless our home. The family had moved in 10 days before. I saw the, the flowers in the living room, the family photos on the wall. I saw the family, the parents, when they returned from the hospital. I heard the mother and the sisters weeping and weeping. I saw the water, father walking around shell-shocked. It looked like he was sleepwalking in a bad dream that will never end. I saw the neighbors try to comfort them. I heard a man tell the father, when it looked like he was about to break down, your son is a bird in heaven. The next day I saw, went to another funeral. This was for a woman who had three sons, 18, 14, and 12. She had been shot and killed. At one point I found myself walking next to a woman who it turned out was the dead woman's neighbor. This woman had gone to college in the US. She told me about her friend. She said that just a few days before, her friend had been asking what it was like to go to college in the US because her 18-year-old son wanted to come to college here. This woman explained to me it's every boy's dream in Palestine to go to college in the U.S. But she said, of course, he won't go now. He'll stay home to help his brothers. And I saw so much more. More destroyed homes, more destroyed children. But when I returned to the United States, I'll skip some of this, I uh, went to the library to see what had been reported while I was gone. I took out every San Francisco Chronicle that had been reported during that period. and went through it one by one, writing down head, each headline and what it contained. I went to the library to do this. And as I sat in the library that day, I was appalled 
that would have been considered news coverage. I saw headline after headline after headline about an Israel under siege. I had gone to Israel. I had joined throngs of shoppers, taken buses and taxis. I had gone to a cafe and sipped a cappuccino. And I had thought about what was, just, what was going on just out of sight, just a little ways away in the West Bank and Gaza. I noticed that on the, the very day that nine-year-old Obai had been killed, the San Francisco Chronicle hadn't had room to publish that news. But it did print a story about children that had been killed over 50 years before in a Holocaust that it is too late for the world to prevent. Instead of telling us about what is going on now, that we, if we chose to, could stop. One day I was in a hotel room in Gaza, sitting down to write another news report that I now know wouldn't have been published anyway. But instead of writing a news report, I wrote a, a letter to Americans back home. I'll read it to you now. Come to Palestine and see how your tax dollars are spent. Visit a hospital with me and see a boy with a bullet hole in his back. See children with scared eyes and legs that don't work anymore. A terrified old man whose neck is swathed in bandages from the bullet that passed through it as he sat in his home, drinking his tea. Come with me and visit mothers of dead, injured, gone children, thousands of them, and tell them how you didn't know we supplied the weapons that ripped flesh, broke bones, destroyed lives, destroyed lives. Talk to old women who are made to kowtow to uzi to 19-year-olds who tell them, no, you can't go to visit your son today. No, you can't take a drive in the country. No, you can't go to the hospital and have your chemotherapy, your dialysis, your operation, and watch as they die. Come to the borders with me, invisible lines in the sand between towns that Israel has drawn with its tanks and helicopters and 200 nuclear weapons. And watch the women with difficult births deliver dead babies and then die themselves at military checkpoints, death points when soldiers with their ultimate power decide not to let them pass. Listen to these young warriors with their lethal weapons and deadly tempers proclaiming, we've decided to close this road, and if you don't like it, we'll shoot you, as we already have 10,000 of your countrymen. Don't look at us wrong, or we'll shoot out your eyes as we have 28 of your children. We're not cruel. We left 27 of them with one eye. Go home, Arab, and wait. And pray we don't decide to show it, as we have thousands of those others who were in our way with the wonderful singing missiles the U.S. gives us. Go harvest your crops, Eric, until we decide to bulldoze your 100-year-old date palms and ancient olive groves, your strawberry fields forever gone. Come to Palestine, Americans, and see your tax dollars at work, millions and millions of them every day, every day and weep with me for our victims and our guilt, and then say, no more. Saying, I heard the debate last night. 
me and my buddies trained by the Israeli military are going to come in and kill all of you. Uh, don't do what you're doing. Uh, don't come to your office Monday at 2 p.m. or we will kill you all. So we got that a number of years ago. And you see they failed. Uh, we, we get harassing emails sometimes. I've seen phone calls and emails sometimes. Uh, mainly defamation. If, if you Google my name, you'll see all sorts of you know, very nasty slurs against me, in some cases against my family. Uh, they have, I, I was actually given a packet of information against a Seville conference, which is a Christian Palestinian type of organization. And as part of the packet, they had 18 pages against me, telling people how to ask questions, how to try to counter me, that kind of thing. So there's clearly a, a very, very organized effort to prevent people from giving the facts on Israel Palestine. A very organized effort to do that. And some places are paid to do that. I hope you don't mind. I have two questions. Um, first, thank you so much for coming here and sharing your very courageous story. Um, my first question is, um, in light of the flotilla raids of last year, um, we heard that Israel was going to take all of the aid that was given and, you know, look through it and make sure that there was nothing, that Hamas wasn't trying to, I'm sorry, that other um, terrorist groups weren't trying to smuggle um, weapons into Palestine. Do we... And I, and, I, and I look through uh, newspapers and different sources to see what types of aid they're saying they're letting in. Is any of that aid getting to the Palestinian people? That's a good question. Um, the Gaza the situation now, just to sort of summarize for people that might not have been following this closely, is that Gaza, I didn't mention this before, when they went through their settlers, they closed it off, they largely sealed it off and controlled all the borders of Gaza. For, to get, they had already, before that, when I was there in 2001, they were already getting, letting very few people get in and out. The first time I tried to get in, I couldn't get in. And then I went back and managed to get in. So even before 2005, the so-called disengagement, when they removed the settlers, they were already, Gaza was fairly sealed off, closed off, not sealed off. Then in 2005, it was sealed off. So that you couldn't get to Gaza, you couldn't fly there, they, they destroyed the airport. Um, you couldn't get in through any of the borders from Israel because they were all closed off. And Egypt, Mubarak was there in our despot. So he also was, you know, was doing what Israel said. So lots of humanitarian groups were warning about a, an impending humanitarian catastrophe that was starting to be malnutrition, not, not visible famine, but malnutrition you know, among children, perhaps stunting of growth among children, non-visible kinds of results of lack of food and products. Christian Aid uh, wrote an article saying that Israel was using food and medicine as weapons because they were restricting the food and, and medicine that was getting into Gaza. Um, they would periodically let in little dribbles, you know, and, and then it would look like to people that didn't know it, oh, it's getting in there. But you look and say, well, this is a population of one and a half million people. And it used to be something like maybe 800 trucks. And they let in 100 trucks. You know, in a population that was already underserved. So they, the dribbles might look like a lot. Oh, 100 trucks sounds like a lot. But then you could, oh, wait a minute, no, it's not. So they were already letting in little dribbles. Um, but the, the humanitarian reports continued by UN reports, UNICEF, reliable types of places kept saying, no, it's still, you know, there's still considerable problems here. And especially a lot of, what's especially troubling is a lot of patients 